Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. This morning, I want to talk to you about the the attribute of grit. Can you say grit with me? (laughs) Grit. Uh, In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the scripture says, let us run with endurance. Let us run with fortitude. Let us run with grit. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. And it goes on to say that there's, um, whenever we are on this earth and we are following Jesus, there's a resiliency that you and I have to tap into in order for us to live a long shelf life as a follower of Jesus here on this earth. Because there's opposition constantly in our lives. Opposition in your marriage, opposition in every aspect of your life, in your business, in your own personal life, the sin nature, all this kind of stuff will try to rise up to try to take you out. Isn't that the the truth? Anybody ever feel that? But the battle belongs to the Lord, amen? And he's good. So there's four qualities that we're gonna be looking at of a different spirit uh, over this next month. The the, 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 uh, series is kind of, in and out. Next week, you'll have Joel, Joel's uh, dad, Rick Mom, coming and ministering God's word. Then we'll have John, John James, who is actually the former lead singer of uh, Newsboys. He's going to be speaking at the men's encounter. Then he's going to be speaking that Sunday as well. And then Pastor Joel will be back, and then he'll be ministering God's word to us as well. But um, these qualities that we're looking at today, we're looking at this idea called grit. This all comes from a character in the scripture that is named Caleb. And Caleb is found in the Old Testament, and we're going to take a look at that uh, this morning. So in the early days of Israel, you know, when God delivered uh, Israel out of Egypt from Pharaoh's hand, God was leading um, Moses to lead his children into what they called the promised land. And the promised land is an endowment from God Almighty to his children. It's actually like your inheritance, As a follower of Jesus, you and I have an inheritance, an endowment, a a legacy, a heritage that God wants to give to every single one of you. He's made a deposit. He gave us his will. As a matter of fact, he wrote the will. How many of you guys have ever been a recipient of someone's will? Cool. How much did you get? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) So when you write a will, you write down who it's supposed to go to. And you can only, usually you can only receive uh, the benefits of that will after the individual who signed that will uh, dies. Well, uh, my Lord and Savior, our master, Jesus Christ, he wrote the will and he signed it with his own blood and he is dead. So now you and I are a recipient of the inheritance. You can tap into that inheritance. And so God was leading them into what they call the promised land. It was available for them just like it's available to us. It's a birthright. And so before they go into the promised land, God uh, told Moses to go get 12, one one leader from every tribe, there was 12 tribes, go in there and spy out this land. And one of the leaders that they chose was a guy by the name of Caleb. Caleb was about 40 years old at this time. And those leaders went into the promised land for, I mean, into that, to go spy that out into uh, for about 40 days. After 40 days, they brought back a, a report to Moses and uh, to find out exactly what was in that land, in that area. And so 10 of, those, 10 of those individuals, 10 of those leaders brought back what they call a negative report uh, based upon their fear, based upon what they saw, based upon their feelings. Bless you. And, and, um, and only two of them, Joshua and Caleb, they brought back a report that was according to the convictions of their heart. God had gave them a promise to enter into that land But these guys, they got obscured, they got distracted by paying more attention to the giants and to the stuff that was in there rather than paying attention to the promise that God had already given them. And so this angered the Lord. The negativity angered the Lord. Y'all stop being negative, okay? As a matter of fact, he was so angry that God made a decree that the people would not enter into the promised land, that the people who brought, who were negative, they would go into the wilderness for 40 years until that generation had died. And they all died. So I said, don't be getting negative on me. But Caleb was honored by God. Why? Because he followed him 
holy in his heart. And so this is kind of where we pick up the story in, in Numbers and in Joshua as well. So let's take a look at that um, in Numbers, the 14th chapter. It says, my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him. What made him, what caused him, because he was in the middle of that climate of all that negativity, just like many of us are in the middle of a climate and a culture that we're living in right now with a bunch of negativity all around us. And if we're not careful, we'll buy into that. It will just get sucked into that. Next thing you know, we're drifting away in that negative mindset. And we're paying more attention to the news and all the negativity that's taking place rather than to the promises of God's word that he has for every single one of us. And so it says that he had a different spirit. He followed me wholly. I'll bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Now, if you go forward in that story, Caleb himself uh, shares a testimony, his own personal words about his story, first person. So it's right here in Joshua. And he says, I was 40 years old when Moses sent me to explore the land. I brought him back a report according to what? My convictions. I brought back a report, not according to these other 10 guys. And these guys were very influential. These were leaders who, whose report actually impacted a whole nation. He says, I brought back a report according to my convictions, but my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed God wholeheartedly. There was something on the inside and the God's spirit was on the inside just saying, man, you got to trust in God's promises over what these words, what these men are saying, over what you see with your eyes, over what you feel with your body. He says, that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance. Now, unfortunately, because of the negative report of the 10 that they had to go around in the wilderness for 40 more years. So he didn't become a, his, his inheritance was delayed 40 years because of someone else's craziness. You know, sometimes we pay a price or our promises are delayed because of something that's no fault of yourself. That's good, that's good. But what do you do when you're in that transition time? What do you do when you're in that sacred space? You continue to believe God. You continue to trust God. You continue to press into God. You continue to hold on to his promises, amen? And it wasn't until uh, Caleb was 85 years old that he was able to go in there and take that mountain and, and, and allow him to get the inheritance that God had promised him back then. Caleb possessed those four qualities, grit, focus, courage, and humility. And today we're looking at this idea called grit. So let's define grit. Grit is the passion and perseverance for a very long-term goals. It's stamina. It's the, uh, it's the, and as a matter of fact, when I say grit, you just repeat it after me. Okay. Say grit. grit. Okay. So throughout the service, you just guys do that. Okay. So when I say grit, y'all say grit. All right. Grit. <laughs> okay. Sticking with your future day in and day out, just holding on. Not, you know, you just got tenacity. It's, it's, the, it's a holy resilience in the face of whatever adversity you're facing. It's something that's deep on the inside. In today's culture, like in the days of Caleb, the landscape that we are currently living in can have a tendency to cause you to panic. If you pay so much attention to it that you all of a sudden dismantle inside and you forget God's promises in a moment like this. You got a pandemic that's killed over 4 million people. You got prices that are going higher. You got a shortage in uh, all kinds of uh, labor shortages that are going on. You got parts shortages that are going on. We can't even get parts right now. Enormous debt that's taking place in our nation. You got the giant of violence and high crime. You got depression and prescription drugs going out the craziness right now. There's all kinds of stuff happening in the landscape of our culture right now that if you're not careful, you'll get sucked in. And I'm hearing a lot. I'm hearing a lot everywhere we go. The negativity that's going on all over the place. Are you vaccinated? Uh, are you vaccinated? Even before, man, it's just like, pastor, use your pulpit to, vac to, to talk about vaccines. I'm like, no, I'm not using my pulpit for that. I, I can't do that. Why? Why don't you do that? It's because I've seen people who had vaccines and die. And I've buried people who didn't have vaccines and die. And so the common denominator in both is that everybody's going to die. 
And so I have an answer for that. Jesus, he made a way so that when you die, yet you shall live. I am the resurrection and the life. And so that's why this pulpit is here. So if you're not careful, you'll get sucked into the negativity and what's going on in our culture that, man, you'll forget about the promises of God, the inheritance that he's, that he's given to us so that we can walk victoriously and uh, more than a conqueror. It doesn't mean that you won't trip up. It doesn't mean that you won't have setbacks. But I'm telling you, God's spirit will rise up on the inside and you need to have grit. grit. Thank you. So that we can keep pursuing and moving forward in life. We need to possess, like Caleb, a different spirit. Amen. One that honors God. One that trusts in his promises. And speaking of that four-letter word, I read about another man named John Wesley Powell. I read this, to, I read this a few uh, months ago, and I shared it with the guys in our, in our band of brothers on a morning breakfast. But John Wesley Powell, 1869, he was a 35-year-old professor of, of geology. He attempted to do something that, would, that seemed impossible. Uh, some experts called it a death wish. And Paul's, uh, Paul's dream was to be the first person to cross the Grand Canyon traversing on the uh, uh, Colorado River. But here's the catch. He had nine people in his crew. And not one of those nine people had ever ran over a single rapid. No one had ever done it. And they're about to face over 500 rapids as you go down that Colorado River. You know, today people do it all the time, but back then, no one had ever done it. It was like a do or die mission at that time. And here's the other catch, is that Paul, Powell was five foot six and weighed about 120 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> and more than that, topping that, Paul, Powell had lost his right arm in the Civil War. So Powell, he couldn't row. He couldn't swim, and he couldn't paddle. Yet, in spite of all those odds, he had the will to conquer it. There was a guy named, an editor from the Springfield Republican, Samuel Bowles, who said he met him right before the expedition took place. And this, uh, um, this man told him, he goes, whoever dares to venture into this canyon will never come out alive. But Powell never allowed the limitations that you know, others thought he had to keep him from pursuing you know, the dream and the adventure and the thing that was on the inside of him. He had grit on the inside. Gracias. You're late. One biographer labeled Paul, Paul a single-minded as a buzzsaw. I don't know what a buzzsaw is, but buzz, you, you, they're just, they attack you. They just cut it right, right away. Anybody live with a, never mind. That idea, listen, that's, that's the thing. Whatever Powell had, that's what it takes to accomplish the impossible. In one word, Powell had grit. grit. Fortitude in the face of fear. Resilience in the face of rejection. A no guts, no glory attitude in the face of impossible odds. Let's talk a little bit more about that little four-letter word. Is that all right? Yeah. What is it? It's putting yourself in positions that will push you past your previous limits. That's what that word is. If, 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 if some of us guys just reflect a little bit, when did you feel most like a man? When did you feel most like, and women also, when, not, not when did you feel most like a man, but <laughs> when did you feel most like you conquered something? Usually, if you reflect, it's whenever you pushed past your limits, either physically or emotionally, and you, you didn't think you were going to make it, but man, you pushed it, you got to the other side, it's like, man, I made it. This came to pass. And usually it's in those moments. Isn't that true? When you push yourself past those limits, not only physically, but in your faith as well. When you're trusting God, we're believing God right now for 12 years uh, about a, a very personal matter in our lives. And finally, we see, we see a crack right now. And we're just holding on. I'm telling you, man, it just takes resilience on the inside to keep pursuing what God has put in front of you year after year, day after day, month after month. You know, Jesus, that's your DNA, folks. That's the DNA that you have. When you became a follower of Christ, God's spirit, the, the same one that was in Jesus, is now inside of us. Yes, thank you, Lord. The scripture says that Jesus said, I will never leave you like an orphan. What Jesus was to the disciples, uh, the Holy Spirit is to us, to lead us and to guide us and to na help us navigate through all the things that um, we will, you know, come up against in life. And so when Jesus died on that cross, he didn't die so that you could play it safe on this earth. He died to make you and I dangerous. 
dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. And if you guys don't take advantage of that, guess what? You're just gonna be a shallow Christian walking in the lust of your flesh, walking with the pride of life, you know, giving, lending your ear and your eyes to the things that this world has to offer, you know, allowing the sinful desires to rise up big and let them overtake you. And you're wondering, why doesn't God bless me? Well, the same spirit that's on the inside that gives you resilience to overcome odds in life will also help you overcome the sin nature that's on the inside of us. It's good. It's good. So we can't give in. We should have a different spirit. And the different spirit that we lend ourselves and yield ourselves to it should have a different outcome in life. Amen? Amen. We can't spend the life running away from the things that we're afraid of. We can't afford to forfeit our dreams at the altar of fear. We can't let the greatest regrets be the God-given opportunities that we we will never pay attention to. We can't let the the greatest regrets be the God-sized dreams that we don't go after or the God-given passions we don't pursue. Holy grit, whenever you have that, y'all didn't say that, huh? Uh, Holy grit, that's okay, you you can stop. Uh, Stop, okay, you can stop now, okay? (laughs) Because you're gonna wind up saying something else. It's not good, another four-letter word, that's not good. Holy grit will put a boldness on the inside of you. Holy grit will put a a, a passion, will give you confidence in the middle of any adversity that you take. Holy grit will be like Caleb when he says, give me this mountain at 85 years old. Holy grit will give you the confidence like David when he went up against Goliath. He goes, who is this, you know, uncircumcised Philistine who defies the armies of the living God? Holy grit was like Peter when Jesus was getting arrested. Man, Peter pulled out his knife and and he said, lend me your ear. And he cuts the ear off of that Roman soldier. He went totally Mexican on him. (laughs) Right? Holy grit is what Jesus did whenever he was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. And he was, man, he was was weak and, and he was, you know, thirsty. He was hungry. And the enemy came in to tempt him, just like he comes and tempts us. But he rose up with resiliency on the inside. He had grit on the inside. He goes, no, Satan, get behind me. It is written, thou shalt not worship, but only the Lord God, your mighty. There's other things that he said, amen. That's the resiliency. That's the grit that Jesus has. That's what you and I, grit will never allow the circumstances that you have in life come between you and your God. Amen. Amen. Weak Christians do that. They succumb to the circumstances and they just bail the promises of God. But a person who is on fire for Christ, a person who has grit, grit will allow God, will always put God in the middle of those circumstances because God is bigger. See, the children of Israel, they were weak. All they saw was the giants in the land and their God was real small. But Jacob, I mean, Joshua and Caleb He saw that God was bigger than any of those giants and they held fast to the word of truth. Isn't that the truth? Is it time already? That's okay, keep playing though. I love that. (laughs) Your grit reveals the size of your dream. That's good. Your dream reveals the size of your God. Is God bigger than the giants you're facing right now in your marriage? Is God bigger than the giants you're facing in your life as a single mom? You have the grit, the DNA of Jesus on the inside of you. Is, 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 is it bigger than what God's put on the inside of you? Is God bigger than your past mistakes? Is God bigger than your worst failures? Yes, he, is. he is. He's a great and mighty God. Where does grit come from? Thank you for asking. It's in Genesis. In the book of Genesis, the scripture says when God was telling Adam, fill the earth and subdue it. That word subdue in the Hebrew means kibosh. If you want to remember kibosh, remember the old Batman and Robin movies when they would go bam, pow, kibosh. That's how you can remember that. But that word kibosh in Hebrew, it means subdue. It has three meanings. One, it's to make a path. It means to blaze a trail. It's almost like you have a machete and there's a jungle in front of you and you're blazing a trail for the next generation so they can follow there in your footsteps. You're making a path. It also means to bring under control like a cowboy breaking a, a wild colt or a new colt. You've got to, you, it also says, you know, you got to control it. You got to conquer it. It also means to conquer. And the scripture says that you and I are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And I, I know it sounds a little forceful. I know it sounds a little intense like pastor. That's, 
You're getting a little loud. <laughs> Calm down. Listen, I go all over the place with my wife and sometimes by myself, but I'm telling you, if you're not careful, you'll allow the spirit of this world and the negativity of this world to suck you in and cause you to become apathetic. You don't need to be fighting other people. Never put a face to your enemy. Hold on to God's promises. Get a hold of God's promises and just put them inside of your heart. Keep them in the midst of your heart all the time. So that when all of a sudden things that, that are contrary to scripture, all of a sudden that filter comes up and the spirit of God will say, that's not true, this is true. And he'll remind you of God's word. Halloween night, 1900. A 10 year old boy named Ike wanted to go trick or treating with his brothers. And when his parents told him that he was too young, Ike got really ticked off. And so he went outside the front door and he punched an apple tree until his knuckles were raw and red from blood. Daddy saw that and daddy got a little upset. <clears throat> Ike's father lashed him with a hickory stick and sent him to his room. He was still sobbing on his pillow an hour later when mom walked into the room and she sat down on the rocking chair next to his bed. And as she sat, I, did, I didn't say that this time. In the first word, I'm sorry, I said something that was bad. The lady's name, the mom's name was Ida Eisenhower. Ida Eisenhower was the oracle of the family. She sits down next to, <laughs> she sits down next to Ike and begins to share scripture with him. And here's the passage of scripture. It says in Proverbs 16, he that conquers his soul is greater than he that takes a city. Wow. At 76, Ike is President Ike Eisenhower. And as he's reflecting and surveying the landscape of his life, he identified that moment when his mom sat down in that rocking chair as one of the most important moments that made the difference in his life. Self-control didn't come naturally to Eisenhower. As a matter of fact, out of all of his siblings, they said that he was the one that needed uh, to learn about self-control or controlling his passions more than any one of them. And as she bandaged the bleeding hands after beating on that apple tree, she warned him that anger only injures the person who harbors it. Here's my point. Long before that allied commander could lead the most powerful army in the world, it all took place in the beginning as a 10-year-old boy who had to learn how to control his passions. Learn how to control his soul and emotions. Grit means to subdue, to conquer. In order to succeed in the negative landscape that you and I are living in, um, we must first learn to conquer the sin nature that's on the inside of us. Well, how do we do that, Pastor? It was a bloody mess. Jesus won the blood, the blood round. How did he win it? The scripture says in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. How did Jesus win that? His eyes were on you. His eyes were on you. It says, the joy that was set before him, you are the joy that was set before him. I am the joy that was set before him. It says, the reason and the only way he could endure it is because his eyes were fixed upon us. And you know what? You and I as followers of Jesus, we're gonna have to do the same thing, except this, our eyes are gonna have to be upon him. His eyes are upon us and what's gonna help us endure and overcome in the places of adversity, we're gonna to have to keep our eyes upon him. Since we're cloud, surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Isn't that good? We gotta do this wrong, the same thing. He is a good an amazing God. Listen, if grit is the thing that helped Jesus endure the cross, then grit will be the thing that will help you carry your cross for him. So what do you do with all this? Thank you for asking real quick. This week, you want to take a picture of that or something. I want to encourage you to reflect. I want you to think about these statements here that I'm about to make and, and just pause and think about it and be truthful and honest about your life. You know, Caleb, as we said earlier, when he was 40 years old, God was going to bring him into it, but it took a long time, 40 years in the wilderness, and then another five years, 85 years old. And then he entered into the promised land. 
uh, because of the negative climate he was in, he didn't enter until he was 85. He was just as gritty. The scripture says he was just as vigorous. He was just as gritty at 85 as he was at the age of 40. And here's my statement. Don't let age keep you from living dangerously. Don't let, you, don't let age be an excuse in your life. Whether you're eight or 80, be passionate about the God who saved you and secured you for life. Amen. There's so many things that you can do at an older age because sometimes we felt like we missed our opportunity and then you'll begin to live the rest of your life, especially at the end of years, with regret. No, there's so many things that you can still do for the kingdom of God. You can teach all these younger people and pour into them the wisdom that you have. The second thing is this. Is there any executive order that you need to give yourself? Grit begins by conquering the sin nature that tries to rise up on the inside of us. Think about that and just to be honest and truthful. And you know, as soon as you verbalize it, as soon as you just expose that, it begins to die. Secrets held on are alive. They stay alive. That's why we live your life without any secrets. And as soon as secrets are exposed, it begins to die. And even if you just confess it to your, your God and confess it to one other brother or one other sister, Somebody that's not going to go put all that stuff on Facebook or wherever. It's just like, man, hey, brother, I just want to talk to you about something. But let me be honest. All of a sudden, it starts dying in that moment. Good. And then the last thing is this. If you fall into a can of cream this week, make butter. Okay? Don't allow the setbacks, the stuff that you face in life, man. Just be gritty on the inside. You've got to have that quality. And the Spirit of God has already given it to you. And it's not something that's evil. It's something that's powerful. It's something that's strong. It's, it, it, when you look at all the major characters in Scripture, you'll see this quality in every single one of them that overcame. Last thing. Before Paul set to that great adventure and that exploration, you know, out there into the, into the Colorado River and all that, his dad tried to make him change his, his um, career, his career. His dad told him, he goes, son, he goes, you're maimed. You, don't even, you only have one arm. His dad said, why don't you just become a teacher? That's probably a safer or a better profession. And he's trying to make uh, Mr. Powell quit. And guess what? I'm so thankful that he never listened to his dad in that sense because he just pressed in. He knew there was a dream on the inside and he kept on pressing in. And now he's given us these ideas and these stories that we can be inspired so we can continue to pursue the things that God has. Here's my advice to you, Crossroads Church. Don't you ever settle for something less that God has for you in life. Don't you set yourself back. Don't you shrink back. Don't you surrender. Don't you just keep going forward. You might have had some setbacks in life. You might have messed up in life and you feel bad about it. That's okay. You rise up. If a man falls seven times, he will, you just rise up again. Let God be your strength. Let God be your hope. Let God be your future. It's never too late to be who you might have been. Do grit in Jesus name. Amen. Let me pray with you. Father, in Jesus name, we love you. God, you are so good to us. And we thank you that these character traits that we find in scripture from men of God, these are mentors for us, Lord God, so we can learn from their life experience. We can learn um, the things that they did in the face of adversity. And so we thank you that you remind us these things. And this week, Father God, as, as we uh, approach life and we do life with our family and friends and our loved ones and our business, I pray that there's divine intervention. I pray for the spirit of God to rise up big within us that we'll be gritty on the inside, we'll be resilient to walk in love, to walk in strength, to walk in holiness, to walk with your character and nature being reflected in our lives. Forgive us for sin, forgive us for falling short, but God, I thank you that you help us to rise up above those things and be more than conquerors in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. amen. Hey, we love you guys. This Wednesday, we have an awesome brother called, uh, called named Mark McConkie. He's going to be leading us in a night of worship. And then next Sunday, um, Rick, mom, Joel's dad's going to come and minister the word on focus. All right. Have a great week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.